A very warm welcome and thank you to all of you following us on either the European Parliament Stockholm YouTube account or the European Parliament Facebook account. Today's discussion is about the need for a Digital Services Act and a Digital Markets Act and how those two pieces of EU legislation can help create, perhaps first and foremost, a safe and responsible digital sphere and a fair and open digital market. EU regulation of tech companies is likely to become one of the hottest legislative topics in Brussels and in the European Parliament this spring. And our European Parliament liaison office in Stockholm is therefore very happy to host such a knowledgeable panel on this topic today. You will hear from two members of the European Parliament, Mr. Timo Wölken, who is from the group of Socialists and Democrats and who is from Germany, and from Mr. Alex Egos Saliba, who is also from the group of Socialists and Democrats and who is from Malta. You will also hear from experts of the European Commission, representatives of Facebook and Google, and stakeholders like the Norwegian or Swedish company Shipstedt and the Swedish Consumers Organization. My own name is Markus Bornekamp. I'm the head of the liaison office in Stockholm and I will be moderating today's debate. We will have participants participating from Brussels, I think from the UK, from Stockholm, and perhaps from elsewhere as well, as this is a fully digital uh, exercise. Should you, as a viewer, want to pose a particular question to any of the participants, you're welcome to enter your question in the comments field on either YouTube or Facebook, and my colleagues will make sure to transmit the question to me. For clarity, we have divided this discussion into two parts with two different panels. And the first one will focus on freedom of speech on the internet. And the other one will answer the question of how this legislative package or packages can promote democracy. And then we will turn our attention to consumer rights and answer the question of how the legislative package can promote fairness of competition and also com um, protect us as consumers online. So we have two sets of panels, and in the first panel you will meet again then Mr. Timo Völken, member of the European Parliament, Mr. Christoph Schmon from the Electronic Frontier Foundation and who is the International Policy Director there, and you will listen to Mrs. Marisa Jiménez Martín, who is Director and Deputy Head of EU Affairs at Facebook in Brussels. And in the second panel, you will meet the second member of the European Parliament, Mr. Alex Egos Saliba. You will meet Mr. Sinan Aktang, who works with Swedish Consumers Organization, Mrs. Petra Wikström, who works with Shipstedt and is Director of Public Policy there, Mr. Georgios Mavros, who is Public Policy and Government Relations Manager at Google, and finally, Mr. Jakob Kuczarczyk, who is Public Policy Manager for Competition Policy at Facebook. But before we turn to our honourable members in the European Parliament and the other panellists, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Gerard de Graaf, who is Director for Digital Transformation in the Director General that we used to abbreviate to DG Connect, Communications, Networks, Content and Technology. And Mr. de Graaf, I'm very happy to have you here and we're happy to hear you share your insight on the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act with us. Please, Mr. Graf, the floor is yours. Good. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bonekamp, and thank you to the European Parliament Liaison Office in, in Stockholm. And of course, uh, welcome to uh, all the, the panelists and, and everybody that's watching uh, online. Uh, I'm Kira Tefraf, I'm director in DG Connect. I've uh, been working with a, a, a team of colleagues to prepare the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act. And I'm going to try to give you, without being too technical, um, the kind of main main kind of features, the main components of these instruments, and also explain a little bit <coughs> where this is coming from, why we are doing this. I think first, maybe the, the question that you ask is big tech too powerful? Um, I mean, I'm Dutch, so I'm pretty outspoken. I think the answer to that question is yes. Big tech has become too powerful, and, and therefore we need to put in place a, a system to kind of regulate the activities of, of big tech. This is not an anti-platform initiative. I think we all recognize the enormous benefits and conveniences that platforms provide to us in our society as consumers, uh, digesting news, uh, buying uh, products on the internet. I think COVID has all brought that all in, into much sharper relief. But, but we've also seen, of course, some of the downsides 
of, of platforms in the form of, of disinformation, in the form of products that are not always safe in, in, in the form of uh, illegal content or, or, or hate speech. And, 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 and that's the kind of um, focus um, uh, that, uh, that we are taking in the context of the, of the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act. Maybe first a little bit of history. Um, the framework that we uh, have in the European Union to regulate uh, platforms uh, activities is called the European the Electronic Commerce Directive. Um, it's 20 years old and was uh, en entered into force in, in the year 2000. And I mean, I need not say that the world is very different uh, now than it was in, in 2000. Um, the directive has uh, brought enormous benefits, but it really uh, it needs uh, an update. Um, the previous commission um, took the approach that kind of we needed to focus on, on specific problems first. So this took a problem driven approach. Uh, for example, if there was a, a difference in level playing field, we would address those, those issues. So we saw under the previous commission quite a number of initiatives that were relevant to platform regulation, but they were specific to certain specific areas like audiovisual policy, copyright, I think we all remember that, uh, quite heated discussion, electronic communication, cyber security, um, and, 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 and other issues like, um, like telecommunications or, or, or geo-blocking. The, the, the previous commission also kind of had um, uh, a lot of emphasis placed on self-regulation, co-regulation with um, a codes of conduct that the, uh, the, the platforms uh, were, were kind of uh, setting up and, and, and implementing. The, 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 the new commission or this commission, the, the, the commission of President von der Leyen has taken a bit of a different approach. Has said, look, now we need a, a more horizontal framework, a modern regulatory and supervisory framework to achieve the three things. One is to ensure safety um, on the internet, both in terms of content that we, uh, we see, in terms of products and services that we buy, to protect fundamental rights, critical. This is like absolutely core to the European Union. To promote competition, effective competition in the platform market. The platform market is driven by um, network effects. It's winner takes all. So you see quite uh, a limited number of, of very big players that kind of uh, control these markets um, and, and that has an impact on competition. And last but not least, as a kind of an overarching objective is to ensure that the single market can work well, because over the years we have seen increasingly member states regulating in these areas. This leads to fragmentation. We've also seen a lack of cooperation between the member states and, and as a result of this, a lack of trust. And this has all kind of eroded um, the, uh, the benefits of, of, of the single market and has made it more difficult for um, platforms, um, particularly the smaller platforms, to benefit from the scale of the single market. There are about 10,000 small European platforms. It is almost impossible for these platforms with all these different rules and regulations to grow and scale up and become European success stories or, or, or global success stories. So that is what drives us. This is what is behind the two proposals that the the, commissions, uh, the Commission has made, and this is what we are kind of trying to, to achieve. Maybe a, a few points now on the two instruments. Uh, the first, as I said, is to make the internet, the first objective is to make the internet safer, uh, to make sure that we're not exposed, we're not as much exposed to illegal content, that if there are illegal products or activities, that prompt action is taken by platforms to to remove those, those products and, and, and services. Uh, that is the Digital Services Act. So that is focused on very much on the content, on the safety side. The Digital Markets Act is focused on the competition side, on the contestability of markets. How easy is it uh, to, to go into this market and compete? On the Digital Services Act, and I'm just going to give you, say, the, the, the main features not go into technical detail. The focus is very much on illegal content. Uh, um, the Digital Services Act takes a systemic 
approach. So we're not kind of trying to regulate each piece of content or each, each product. What we are trying to regulate in the Digital Services Act is to ensure that platforms have systems in place that make it kind of, that can give us confidence that there is as little as possible chance that illegal content and illegal uh, goods uh, make it, it to the platform. And when they are on the platform, that there are mechanisms in place to allow these, uh, these illegal content, illegal goods to be removed as soon as possible from the platform. So it's a systemic approach. It is to, to, to look at the platforms and say, do you have systems in place that give us that degree of confidence? It provides a framework for procedures uh, to ensure due process and legal certainty. And so it sets out again how the cooperation, how kind of citizens can interact with platforms, how governments can interact with platforms in order to kind of ensure that there is due process, legal predictability, and that the outcomes are the ones that we, we would like to see. I think what is really important in the Digital Services Act that it is asymmetric. Uh, there are obligations that are put on platforms, but the obligations are proportionate to the impact that the platforms have on our markets and on our societies. In other words, if you are a big platform, you will have to meet uh, a higher uh, standard of, of due diligence obligations. You will have more responsibilities. If you're a smaller platform, you have less responsibilities. But what are these responsibilities? If you're a very large platform, for example, which we define as a platform that has at least 45 million users across the European Union, you have to put in place a system which we call notice and action. So that if there's a consumer who sees something on the platform that uh, is suspect, might be illegal, there's a way to notify that to the platform to make sure that the platform is aware and can take the necessary action. We're foreseeing a system of trusted flaggers, so people are kind of specialized in, in particular types of contents or particular type of products, market surveillance authorities, for example, or those who are kind of looking at respect for copyright um, rules. Um, if, if we look at marketplaces, uh, we're, we're, we're kind of requiring these marketplaces to do due diligence checks on those third party sellers that use their marketplace in, in order to provide goods and services to, to the consumers. So know your business customer, check out, is that business legitimate? Um, what happens if, if, if something goes wrong? Can a consumer kind of um, get redress? Very important. We foresee cooperation with public authorities. We foresee risk assessment mechanisms. We foresee external audits by independent auditing companies whether to see whether these systems are indeed in place and they are working. We foresee transparency on content moderation policy. How are algorithms being used? Why are we seeing what we are seeing? Why are we seeing particular types of advertising? It's important to know. We foresee regular reporting. So there's a whole long list of due diligence obligations that indeed the very large platforms would have to comply with shorter obligations for the smaller platforms. There is reinforced administrative cooperation between the member states. We must make sure that the member states trust each other. You know, these platforms are particularly established in some countries like Ireland or the Netherlands or Luxembourg. They need to act in the interest of everybody. So if you are in France or you're even in Germany, you need to have confidence that these platforms are well regulated. You need to have interaction between these uh, competent authorities that the platforms actually comply with, with the rules and regulations and that if there, are some, if there is a problem that that problem is promptly resolved. So we're putting in place a much more coordinated and substantive administrative cooperation system to build trust and to make sure that the internal market can work in this area. Last but not least, in terms of supervision, there is the possibility for the EU to take over. If there is a particular problem of a systemic nature, the supervision can go from the member state level to the EU level under certain conditions. So then the European Commission will become the supervisor of these platforms. Let me move to the Digital Markets Act, which is about market contestability. How easy is it to go into the market as a competitor? What are the market entry 
barriers. We are strongly in favor of competition. Uh, we think competition is good, it brings huge benefits, it promotes innovation, uh, and, 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 but, but it needs to take place on fair terms. The Digital Markets Act is saying, please compete, compete your heart out, but do it in a fair way. There are certain practices, which of course we have looked at over, over a number of years, also have a lot of experience with in terms of competition enforcement policy, that we would consider are not fair. Uh, it's a bit like in sports, if you would run 100 meter dash and, and the, 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 your competitor next to you would be running kind of the, uh, with hurdles in, in, in place. That is not fair. So we have defined in the Digital Markets Act for gatekeepers, so these are very, very large companies on the basis of size, on the basis of dependency, on the basis of the durability of their strength, competitive strength in the market, a number of practices between 15 and 20, which we say, once this measure is adopted, no, this is not fair. These practices cannot continue. They have to, to stop. Well, what type of practice are we talking about? Self-preferencing, for example. Now, you shall not use information about a competitor, for example, a third-party seller on your platform, in order then to compete and undercut that third-party seller. You shall not prevent somebody who is using your platform to be able to sell the services and goods outside of the platform. You shall not prevent that. You shall not prevent such a company to make publicity for that type of information. So it's all quite straightforward practices that we say, this is not fair. They have to stop. They have no place in the European Union. Well, let me draw the kind of this, this brief introduction to, to a conclusion. I think first um, of all, I mean, I saw in the introduction that, I mean, this is going to lead to heated debates and, and, and quite challenging kind of uh, negotiations in, in, in the Council and the Parliament. Well, this is important. We are kind of setting a, a standard for, for kind of the, 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 the practices and the behaviors and, 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 and what, what kind of how platforms need to work and, and operate in our in our society so absolutely this will uh, have, there will be a lot of attention a lot of discussion but we are quite positive in the commission that there is a consensus around how to do this uh, we have worked upstream very intensively i mean and i'm extremely grateful we in the commission are extremely grateful to, to mr saliba and also to mr Boyken for all the work that they have done in terms of preparing kind of the, the, the reports in the European Parliament, the context which we've had, that there is a, a, an emerging consensus that will kind of, this is not going to be copyright uh, number two. Uh, this is going to be much more consensual, even though there, there will be differences kind of, and, and there will be some, some discussions, but, but we are quite optimistic that this can be brought to a, a conclusion before too long. The other thing is that we are quite mindful that we are kind of going to set a world standard here. Uh, there's a lot of attention from third countries in what the European is doing. These issues are of course not just unique to the European Union. Illegal content is not unique to the European Union. And so there is also a, a great opportunity for the European Union here to kind of set uh, the tone and, 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 and put in place a standard that, that could uh, be uh, an important source of inspiration to the rest, to the rest of the world, particularly like to, to democratic societies like ours. So, so that's, I think, by way of, of introduction, I'm looking forward to a, a very good and, and, and interesting debate. And of course, if there are questions, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. De Graaf, for this overview of what is indeed two very complex uh, legal acts or proposals for two legal acts. May I just pose one question, and that is, uh, in the Commission, we often hear the quotation, what is illegal offline should also be illegal online. Now, my question is, is this a vision or is this a target that you expect to reach? After all, the online and the offline world look quite different. Well, <clears throat> uh, it, it is an important principle. Uh, I mean, and I think it's very hard to argue against that what is illegal uh, offline uh, uh, should be illegal online. I mean, the problem that we, we often have is, of course, illegal 
activities or content uh, online can, can, to, can tend to spread much faster. I mean, the, it's, it's much harder to address these, these issues in an online environment than it is to address them in, in an offline environment. Also because it's not always entirely clear kind of what, what needs to be done by whom in an online environment. So we, we believe that if we were not defining in the, in the Digital Services Act what is illegal. That is defined either in certain kind of European uh, rules or regulations, for example, the, the definition of terrorism, or it falls under national law. So we are not defining what is illegal. That has already been defined. And what we're trying to do here is to put in place processes, steps, procedures that will kind of help to, um, to, to, to reduce and, and, and where possible to remove illegal activity and illegal content from the internet, from, from the platforms, uh, which of course is in the interest of the platforms uh, themselves. But uh, it cannot be that something that's illegal offline would suddenly no longer be illegal online. But there are different challenges because offline, the offline world is different from the online world, as we all know. Thank you very much, Mr. De Graaf. And with that, I turn to you, Mr. Timo Völken. You are a member of the European Parliament and you were also the rapporteur of one of the three reports in the run-up to this legislative proposal. And uh, your resolution, I think, has served as a basis for much of the Commission's work. Now, my question to you is, do you feel that your work has been properly inserted in the legislative proposals? Or is there something where you feel that the Commission could have paid great respect to the conclusions of the Parliament, please? Yeah, thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here and to see some familiar faces and new faces. And I uh, think it's, it's the right time to debate uh, the, the two proposals on the table. So in general, I'm quite pleased with the Commission's proposal for the DSA. So when we look back at what we knew about the DSA a year ago, we all knew there was something this would be on the table, but no one knew what would be the content. So soon after the Commission took office, the Parliament went to work and we had five different committees uh, who were working on the proposals and suggestions to platform regulation. And in total, we had 11 reports and opinions. So this shows the broad uh, interest of different committees in this very important issue. Um, my report in the Legal Affairs Committee called for a dedicated legal instrument codifying notice and action procedures for content moderation. And by laying down clear procedural rules, we would protect the fundamental rights of users and give more legal certainty and clarity to platforms who until now had little to, little to no guidance on uh, and on how to avoid liability risk. So I'm very pleased to see that the proposal presented by the Commission uh, largely follows the recommendations of my report with the new dedicated regulation laying down uh, due diligence obligations for online platforms, including clearly defined notice and action mechanism for content moderation. So this shows that the Parliament is no longer just processing whatever input comes from the Commission, but we can take an active part in shaping legislative proposals. So, but uh, of course, there are a few aspects where, would I, where I need to complain. And this is first the Article 6. So it allows platforms to carry out voluntary own initiative investigations to detect and remove illegal content. This must be accompanied by fundamental rights safeguards, clearly stating limits and conditions to voluntary measures to ensure they are proportionate. Otherwise, there is a risk that platforms will start employing upload filters again, and this will then undoubtedly lead to the discussion we had during the uh, copyright dossier. And this was why I was smiling when, when you said that there's a consensus that we don't fight again, but we will see if, if all stays calm or if we need to, to be a little more rough. So this is uh, a question of how we deal with Article 6. Second complaint uh, is according to Article 14, Paragraph 3. A platform becomes liable for illegal content upon receipt of a notice and, uh, of a notice and then must act uh, um, uh, in the same second, literally, to remove it. 
So the validity of a notice hangs on the notifier's understanding of the law and declaration of good faith. So this discourages platforms from verifying the legality of notified content as they rely on the notifier's assessment. And in my view, this will lead to overblocking of content, which is precisely what we are trying to avoid. So Article 14, Paragraph 3 is quite difficult. And third and lastly, my initiative report was very ambitious about regulating the business model of behavioral targeted advertising. So um, this is a report which was the, the one which is the most far reaching. So we even called that the commission needs to consider a phase out of behavioral advertisement uh, because this form of advertising is one of the most harmful forms of surveillance capitalism. And the plenary backed this proposal. So there were some in the parliament who wanted to get rid of the phase out, but in the end it was upheld. So this is a clear signal by the parliament that this is a very important issue for us. And um, yeah, I have the, the, the impression that on this point, the commission is playing the hot potato between the DSA and the democracy action plan in this regard. But I think it's not enough to only cover this issue in the democracy action plan, which is non-binding. Thank you very much, Mr. Vulcan. And indeed, the democracy action plan, we're not going into that in detail today. I'm sure we can come back at a later stage. Uh, you did mention, the, and so did Mr. De Graaf, that there are giant companies who are the uh, uh, scope of this legislation. And I was wondering, what have the lobbying efforts been like in Brussels towards you? And what have you potentially learned from them? Or what did you not expect from them, please? Well, one thing is clear, DSA and DMA as the um, digital Carter of fundamental rights, like, like I would put it, uh, can have a significant impact on business practices of big uh, companies, of fundamental rights of users. And of course, uh, big tech is aware of it. And this also is made clear by the participating speakers today. So um, if we play it right, this legislation can become something like a digital constitution, as I said. Uh, you remember the league strategy paper by Google targeting individual commissioners. This is indeed a level of lobbying that you don't see every day. And um, I think this needs to be uh, rejected. This is not the way we should work with each other. And with the commission proposal now out, I suspect the lobby attention will shift, of course, to the European Parliament. I personally have not experienced any aggressive lobby tactics during this debate. I think it's important for policymakers to hear input from all sides and then take um, your own decision. And while working on my initiative report, uh, I organized a large stakeholder conference. We invited businesses, associations, NGOs, advocacy groups to uh, all gather around a digital table and all presented their positions and they discussed with each other. Each other, each other. And I think there were more than 50 uh, participants. So this clearly highlights uh, that there is a huge interest, um, but I, I think we need to ensure transparency in the process of lobbying. And uh, this is um, uh, very important. And my idea bringing up stakeholders together on the virtual round table, I think was a success for me because different stakeholders started to debate among others. And this is something where we as um, politicians can learn more from uh, compared to the situation where you have a one on one meeting with a stakeholder because then you only see one side of the medal. So this is very important that stakeholders discuss openly together and this is quite productive. Thank you very much, Mr. Vulcan, and I'm also very happy to have two stakeholders on the panel and I turn first to you, Mrs. Marisa Jimenez Martin. You are from Facebook and you are the director and deputy head of EU affairs at the Brussels team. So clearly you're well, well placed to answer these questions, but I thought Obviously, everybody in Sweden and, and also around the world and the globe knows Facebook very well and we know what you do and we perhaps use it on a daily basis. But how would you generally describe your company in light of the DSA and the, and the DMA, these two legislative acts? What, what is it that you do that is now being perhaps put into question? 
Yes, well, um, thanks very much, and, and thanks for for inviting me um, to to the to to the event. I think that everyone uh, everyone knows Facebook, but I think it's a it's a pertinent question to to explain and 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 to describe what is that the company does and what the services that we put um, at at the service of our users. And uh, Facebook is a social media platform, and that means that it's a it's a platform where people users come. Uh, to exchange, to engage, to provide their perspectives, um, to find uh, people that have the same interests or maybe uh, diverse interests as well. And uh, I think it's just the, the, the mission of our company describes it well, which is what we're trying to do here at Facebook, which is to help people build community. And that is really what, um, what this is about. I think that um, in that sense, uh, indeed, uh, as you say, many people in Sweden use many people around the world uh, use Facebook and Facebook products uh, more than more than, you know, billions of people do so. Um, but when you have why is why, why are we involved in this conversation? Obviously, because uh, our th having a platform where people exchange views and, and provide um, uh, their their opinions is is something in a, on at a global scale is a, a very difficult thing to do uh, and to put to to to, to allow for. Uh, if you want that platform to be, you need you need if you want people to come to your platform, it needs to be a safe platform. Uh, it needs to be a platform that allows for people to be free. And uh, in order to do that, there sometimes you need to put limitations to that. You have to have some rules of the game, but those rules of the game have to be fair, have to be transparent, and known by all. Being a global company means that sometimes you have to take decisions um, that don't, that really, that not, not everyone would agree with. Uh, some people believe some decisions are good and, and for the same decision, uh, other people believe that decisions are bad. We, we have called for regulation for a long time on these issues. It's a hard thing to do. And we commend the commission for doing so for trying. So, and the European Parliament and the other legislators in Europe um, and we believe that Europe is a good place uh, to 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 crack on legislation, um, and that's why that's why we're here, and that's why we're we're participating in this debate. And I just want to be very clear that we're doing so with the aim to contribute towards the successful completion of the Digital Services Act, um, and with anything that we can, with our experience. Um, and when we ask for our opinions, we come together to to uh, to Mr. Volkin's uh, point before. So that's just a, a little bit of a flavor of what we are and, and why we're here. Thank you very much, Mrs. Jimenez Martin. I was wondering, from the invitation, we posted the question, is big tech too powerful? And my question to you would be, do you think that Facebook holds power? And if yes, too much power, please? Well, we think we are a successful company. Um, and where we have a lot of users, a lot of people that come uh, to the platform, thankfully. Um, so we are successful and we have a great responsibility. So what you're asking is, do we have a lot of power? Uh, what I would say is we have a lot of responsibility and we have to show it. Um, so in that sense, uh, we, do, we do agree and we have to get better every time. I think that just to link it a little bit to the DSA discussion that we're just having, um, the fact that the DSA, uh, Digital Services Act, has asymmetric obligations or that is built on the assumption or the foundation that larger companies with larger reach um, um, you know, are required to show or implement, to show their responsibility uh, uh, in, a, in a stronger fashion through additional requirements is something that we agree on, we, uh, we agree with. So in that sense, yes, uh, with success comes responsibility. Thank you very much. And I turn then to our third participant, Mr. Christoph Schmon. You are the International Policy Director at Electronic Frontier Foundation, and you are a very different sort of stakeholder, perhaps. What is the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and why are you interested in these two uh, legislative acts, please? Good morning. First, I would like to thank the organizers for having me. I appreciate it. Um, EFF is a non-profit organization, and what we do is to defend freedom of speech, privacy, and innovation online. 
So we have, of course, user rights and the free internet at heart. And we are an organization that is based in San Francisco, but we focus on all important international policy developments. And of course, the DSA is a massive policy development. It deals with content moderation, transparency, algorithmic decision making, and liability, and many other things. So it will have a tremendous impact on user rights and freedom online. And it was stated before that DSA will um, apply to platforms that are not based in the EU. So it will have, like the GDPR, a quite, a, a, quite an outreach. It could reshape the internet worldwide. So you can imagine that for EFF, this reform process is a huge opportunity um, to work together with the EU institutions, with TIMO, with other members of parliament to empower users to protect their rights better, to enable better market competition. So what we do now is to work closely together with all stakeholders, with the EU institutions, and together with our colleagues from the Adrian Network, the EU Digital Rights Group. And we try to make sure that the voice of civil society organizations are represented in debate and not for, um, forgotten about. Thank you, Mr. Schmon. And this regulation, as we heard from the Commission, will uh, revise or replace the e-commerce directive, which has 20 years uh, this year. And I was wondering what kind of practices, perhaps harmful practices, have developed over the 20 years that you hope that this new piece of legislation will put an end to, please? Yeah, as it was rightly said before, the, the piece of law is 20 years old. It's quite a bit of time. Um, the internet develops quickly. Um, back then, when the e-commerce directive was adopted, there wasn't a discussion about targeted ads or privacy issues or algorithmic decision making. The focus was, hey, let's create a successful internet industry in the first place. So what we have seen now is that over the last past years, much has changed and not necessarily do the better. Many users feel being locked into a few powerful platforms which dominate the internet and often the public discourse. So yes, but many platforms have become too powerful. We see that there's a complete lack of transparency, how platforms make decisions, like whether speech is removed or not and under which circumstances. We see that users are non-consensually tracked across the web and often don't feel safe and respected. And that's particularly true for marginalized groups. And one reason is, to answer your question, I would like to hear the opinion of others today on this. It seems to be way easier for platforms to monetize polarization and hate speech than civic discourse. And so we believe that the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act can solve many of those issues if we do it right. I think we could try to use those pieces of law to, to break up the wallet gardens platforms have become. We could think of many measures that empower our users. We could think of interoperability measures. We could try to put users in charge over what they see online, to choose for themselves which kind of content they would like to see or flag problematic behavior. And we could think of procedural justice to users if something goes wrong, which is very important for vulnerable persons. And I think that the commission's proposal was a good start and the reports by Tim and Alex were excellent. And I think now it's the, the right time to continue this pathway and to look further into how can we end the dominance over data and the lack of market competition? Thank you, Mr. Schmoon. And Mr. Wölken, we hear from both participants that there are global players and they are based sometimes outside European Union. Now, in Sweden, over the weekend, there was a series of articles that were running and the question was, who should regulate our freedom of speech? And I believe that your answer would be the EU level. Now, my question to you is, why is the EU level the suitable level for this, please? Well, first of all, I uh would contest that regulating freedom of speech is the right way to do so rather the question should be who should protect our freedom of speech on the internet so and there the first question is should this be done by private companies or by democratic institutions and let's take the uh, example of donald trump's twitter account of course uh, I was happy to see that this man was finally losing his uh, platform, his megaphone. But should a private company really have the power to simply decide to censor an individual's right to express themselves without being, uh, without having the possibility to at least to go to a court and challenge the discussion? If the platform is as relevant as Twitter, is it just? as a question at the beginning. So at the same time, we have seen that Facebook uh, adopted in the first place a laissez-faire attitude towards hate speech and disinformation with Mark Zuckerberg uh, saying he doesn't want to be the arbiter of truth. This sounds very noble, 
but doesn't help if Facebook's algorithms are still favoring attention seeking harmful content to increase uh, profits. And this is where I share the concerns represented by, by EFF, for, for example, here today. So we need accountability. The rules on online speech must be determined by laws, courts and democratic processes, and not only by um, company decisions um, and CEOs. So the next question then is, should this be done at EU level or at national level? level? And the answer to this question is, indeed, is, is not as clear as you suspect. While the freedom of speech is universal, there are illegal forms of speech which are almost regulated by criminal law, which is a matter of national uh, jurisdictions. And we heard this at the very first intervention. So this is challenging for the European Union. But the member states cannot do it alone. If most public debates take place on social media, then which rules are more powerful? National laws censoring illegal speech on the one hand and safeguarding the fundamental rights to freedom of expression on the other, or the terms and conditions of platforms with the most uses. So, and if um, more and more commerce with goods and services is done via online platform, then who prevails? The business practices of the most dominant platforms or national consumer protection laws. So this brings me to the end. If we want online speech to be effectively regulated, safeguarded by public and democratic institutions, we need to apply universal rules throughout the European Union, which lay down uh, the law uh, which should be applied. So in the end, yes, we need uh, guidance from the European uh, level. And so this is why we need the Digital Services Act sooner than later. Thank you very much, Mr. Wurken and Mrs. Jimenez Martin. There were, I wouldn't say allegations against Facebook, but you were mentioned. And I was wondering, what do you think for your company that the result would be if these uh, two legislative proposals were turned into legislation for your company, perhaps, and perhaps for me as a Facebook user, please? Sure. So I will, because I have a colleague later on that is going to deal with the DMA, I'm going to let the DMA side of things for, for my colleague Jacob, but I, I can talk a little bit about the DSA. I, so first of all, I, I'd like to, to say that I, I agree with, it's, it might sound, it, it might sound, uh, it might sound surprising, but it's not. Um, I do agree with, uh, with Mr. Volkin's objectives and solutions. I might disagree with the premise that uh, Facebook makes money out of misinformation or hate speech or doesn't or has a laissez policy maybe for another time because we don't have too much time to discuss that but i do but having putting that aside i do agree with the objectives and i do agree with the solution uh, and we do as well i think that that when it comes to to the dsa what we see today on the table um, we see the foundations of the liability regime maintained I think even tightened uh, with, um, with the ability of, uh, of platforms to continue voluntary measures. I agree that voluntary measures by platforms doesn't mean that we can do whatever that we want and there shouldn't be safeguards. I think that is a, that is a, great, uh, that is a great point. Um, we agree with the fact that the, uh, the law is based on, on transparency, greater accountability, and a strong oversight. These are the three components that we've always talked about throughout the past two years, and we can find them here. So that is, uh, that is to be uh, very welcome. The difference also in approach between harmful and, 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 um, and illegal content, harmful but legal content. I, wanted to, I want to draw the attention to a particular aspect of the Commission's proposal, which we think is very interesting and, 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 and can be also a source uh, of, of future solutions for, uh, for, uh, for very uh, critical decisions that are made when things are, are illegal and not illegal, like some of these uh, free speech issues that we're talking uh, about, which is the foundation for co-regulation that is included in the DSA. I think it is something uh, worth exploring. Um, 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 to also address and legitimize 
uh, the content standard policies uh, that have been mentioned here uh, of, of companies like Facebook. Uh, in that sense, from the, uh, from the kind of things that perhaps require a little bit more clarification, we, we think that the, the, um, the, court, the oversight and the division of, opinion, the division of, of, of powers between the digital service coordinator and the commission is still not very clear um, I, I, I wonder whether this is also clear or not clear to member states um, uh, and something that perhaps would need a, a little bit more discussion or, or clarifications uh, and a little bit more also on the, on, on, the, on the fines and the application to fines linked to systemic failure. So I, uh, we agree with focusing on systemic failure versus individual decisions, but uh, it, it perhaps is not clear enough that that systemic failure aspect still is is the predominant in in the in the uh, in the proposal today so um overall you know there's a, a lot of requirements a lot of transparency reports to do a, a lot of things that will require fundamental structural uh, changes in the way that facebook operate but uh, the the essence of of the proposal is something that we think addresses uh, the, the objectives that we put on the table. At the end of the day, uh, just to wrap up, um, it, trust, so uh, Mr. De Graaf mentioned it before, uh, trust is fundamental. Trust of the member states in what the Commission is trying to do and the European Parliament and the Council are trying to do, trust uh, in the platforms, uh, the trust of our, you know, the trust of our users. So it's fundamental and it is the idea of trust uh, that needs to, to, to drive the completion of this horizontal piece of work. Thank you, Mrs. Jimenez Martin. And I think perhaps many of these uh, issues that you mentioned will be ironed out in the Parliament uh, in a few months' time. Mr. Schmon, uh, as we discussed the level of uh, decision making, the EU level or national level, or perhaps a global level, I was wondering several people, including Commission Vice President Mrs. Jourova, have compared the situations for freedom of speech and in the US and in Europe. What is your opinion? What are the striking differences when dealing with these platforms, if you compare Europe to the United States, please? Well, I think Ms. Yurova is right that the problems are very similar on both sides of the Atlantic, already for the reason that we speak about um, the, most of the same US-based companies. Um, so users here and users over there experience the same struggles, for example, when companies fail to enforce the policies consistently or when there's a lack of privacy or justice. I think there's not, not much of a difference. So I wouldn't be surprised if the responses of, to these problems um, were quite similar from the competition law side, so the, that's now the DMA side, um, which means to scrutinize the market power over consumer data more closely to discuss how to lower um, entry barriers from, for competitors, how to avoid collusive conduct and so on and so forth. And so that could be accompanied by privacy and data focused legislative initiatives. But there are some striking differences, at least for me, being a European Union scholar and now learning a lot about US law, which I think is rooted in the legal culture. Um, I think that in Europe, there is a different sense for responsibility of platforms over potential legal content, which is demonstrated by the liability provisions in e-commerce directive. There's also a very long history of consumer protection. Even freedom of expression in Europe is somewhat different compared to freedom of speech in the US. Um, it doesn't only have a negative side directed against the state, but also a positive side that pushes states towards legislation to protect users from interference by private companies. And perhaps this may explain the political reactions by uh, Angela Merkel and Mr. Breton and to, to focus um, to push the DSA perhaps even um, after the accounts of Mr. Trump were disabled. It was a, somehow a disturbing element for Europeans to see that. Um, and I think that those differences can be overcome for common objectives, but I think there's a challenge in the current geopol geopolitical debate. And I would like to avoid somehow uh, to get into a situation where we start to discuss who is the better censor? Is it states or platforms? I think it's much more important to start to talk about the rights and dignity and autonomy of the fuses. I think if we did that, um, then I think we could, we could find common solution like worldwide solution, because I think this is necessary. We talk about global companies, so we cannot assume that one block um, has their own set of rules and Facebook will change the interface. 
wise in another continent, Facebook will have another interface. Sorry that I've mentioned Facebook now twice, but it's the same true, true for Amazon and for Twitter. Um, so I think this is the discussion we need to have. How are we going forward to protect um, the user rights and focus on what is important for their experience? Thank you very much, Mr. Schmoon. And I turn to you, Mr. Wilken, to wrap up this uh, first panel. And uh, my question would also be, what is now the future of these two legislative proposals? What will we see in the end? What will come out of the European Parliament process, please? Yeah, um, yeah. so we can um, be fairly sure that these proposals will become EU law. Uh, I don't expect trilogue uh, tri negotiations to fail. I hope that the member states are um, more motivated than they are when it comes to the e-privacy regulation. But there is a broad political will shared by Commission, Parliament and, Cou and Council to address the dominance of big tech on the digital single market and its uses. So discussions on how to do this might take a while, but we will get there. There is a lot of pressure to act quickly. The position on, uh, of the Commission and Parliament are very close. The Council is unfortunately still a black box, especially concerning that some member states already have national legislation in place and they are proceeding with new uh, um, this new pieces of law, which is very problematic from my point of view. Uh, it will be up to uh, the incoming council presidency or the new council presidency um, to uh, find a member state's uh, common position, preferably one that allows for smooth trial of negotiations. If the Portuguese presidency succeeds in sealing a general approach within its six month mandate, which is very, very challenging, negotiations can start quickly and we will be looking at entry into force into the next couple of years. So I predict that we will have a lot of fun with this uh, two files for the next two to three years. Thank you very much, Mr. Wölken, Member of Parliament for the Socialist and Democrat Group from Germany. Thank you very much, Mr. Christoph Schmon from the Electronic Frontier Foundation and Mrs. Marisa Jimenez Martin from Facebook for taking part. Thank you very much. And I say welcome to our second panel. Uh, which will deal with the issue, how can this legislative package promote fairness of competition and protect consumers online? And first of all, I say welcome to Member of Parliament, Mr. Alex Agius Saliba, who is also from the group of the Socialists and Democrats, and you are from Malta, Mr. Saliba. So my first question would be the same to you as to Mr. Wölken. You were the leading person behind one of the uh, uh, reports that was sent to Commission and was then forming the basis for this legislation and I was then wondering are you happy with what the Commission has produced and what would you have wished for please? So, first of all thanks for this invite and for this very timely um, debate on the Commission's two proposals on the DSA and the, and the DMA. It's, it's a question which is very difficult to answer when you see the um, chunky proposals that we have um, in front of us. Uh, we say that um, uh, the devil is always in the detail and here we have a lot of details but I believe that this is a, a good start um, for, for discussions. I also believe that the Commission has given heed also to many of the European Parliament's demands in the um, two uh, legislative ENI reports being undertaken by uh, our committee, the Internal Market Committee, the EURI Committee, and also the, um, the LIBE Committee, both uh, on the DSA and also on the, on the, um, on the DMA. Uh, but, but I think that the point of departure has to be that uh, stakeholders, member states, institutions should not see this exercise as a threat to competition, but as a good opportunity to create this level playing field, to put forward uh, the, the uh, you, you made already reference to the, um, basically an important pillar of, of our report and our suggestions of what is illegal uh, offline should also be uh, illegal online, and also basically to create a more competitive um, uh, digital market and also achieving a higher level of consumer protection. When you look at the proposals, I think uh, that when it comes to uh, the most important demands that the Internal Market Committee has moved forward, the extraterritorial effect that we wanted to give to the DSA proposal, it is there. 
when it comes to the Exante internal market instrument that basically is the DMA proposal, defining gatekeepers and also imposing uh, a number of do's and don'ts um, to, these, to these identified um, players having extra responsibility. It's that when it comes to the know your business customer principle, which is of fundamental importance and was of fundamental importance to the discussions, both at technical and political level that we had within the internal market committee, it's there. Is it ambitious enough? No, we don't think so. Um, uh, for example, on this proposal, we were making it clear that this should not be restricted only to um, uh, to, to, um, to platforms, to, to, to online marketplaces, but this should also be um, risked, but this should also apply to um, uh, also those those players who are undertaking also intermediation at technical level. For us, this is important, and I think that there the commission could have been uh, more ambitious when it comes to consumer protection, and this is also the title of this of this chapter. We want of this panel. We wanted that there should that there could have been more focus when it comes to um, achieving this high level of consumer protection. When it comes to online marketplaces, we have a whole chapter in our report dealing with, with online marketplaces. It's a good start that the Commission has dealt with a special liability regime, uh, online marketplaces. Um, but again, even there, uh, we would have liked to see um, more uh, and more and more. Uh, ambition. But again, although the devil is in the detail, we have to continue to discuss these, these initiatives, both at political and technical level within the European Parliament. Um, I think that it is a still a good start um, for, for discussions, a lot of elements that we wanted, the harmonized notice and action procedure is also there. Again, from our end, there, there are a lot of questions when it comes, for example, to trusted flaggers. How are we defining and the role that we are giving to, to trusted flaggers? I, I think that there should be uh, more, more transparency there. When it comes to advertising, um, again, it was a good start from the Commission. But again, when it comes to recommender systems, we don't believe that these, should, these restrictions should only be um, faced by uh, big tech giants but they should by big platforms but they should be applicable um, to a to a wider set of, of of players so if i would wrap up these initiatives it's a good start the parliament has taken up the majority uh, i'm speaking on behalf of the of the internal market committee's proposals i think the majority of our proposals are there but I believe that we could have been more ambitious, more ambitious, so that we take up fully this opportunity that we have. This is a golden opportunity that we have as a European Union to be standard setters, to be standard setters not only for our continent, not only for the EU, but also to export, export our values to other continents, to players which are established in, in, in other continents who are basically also targeting our markets, our consumers, our users. So it's really important to take fully this opportunity that we have. I don't think that this would be a revision that we will be undertaking, undertaking every, leg every legislature, every five years, every 10 years. So this has to be future proof. Um, and and, and um, yes, it's good, but there could have been uh, more ambition from the heart of the commission. Thank you very much, Mr. Saliba. And speaking on consumer rights, I'm happy to welcome also Mr. Sinan Aktag. You are with the Swedish Consumers Organization and you also have an umbrella organization, the BEUC in Brussels. And um, I would like to know, what, what do you think about the consumer perspective? Is it good from a Swedish consumer perspective or is it good also from a European consumer perspective if these are different, please? Well, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. This is, of course, a very uh, important topic, very timely to discuss it right now. Um, well, if you look at the difference between a European consumer perspective and uh, a Swedish consumer perspective, I don't really think that there is a large difference. I think uh, consumers want the same things, no matter in which country we reside. I mean, we want 
safe products. We want uh, fair terms. We want uh, transparency when it comes to sustainability. Uh, and we want to have meaningful privacy controls as well. Uh, and I agree with, with Saliba's uh, impression here that this is a good start, probably a good general direction. But I think that seeing that this will really be a landmark legislation, we need to go further. We need to put more pressure on, for instance, online marketplaces. They are continuing to, to uh, promote and market and sell uh, dangerous products. Uh, and they don't have any economic incentive to actually make sure that these products are in fact safe. Uh, so it's a good start, but I think we could go further. And you mentioned the dangerous products that are on sale on marketplaces. What, what would you wish for here? What level of consumer protection would you wish for? And how could it be embraced, please? Well, I, I think what we're seeing in the current proposal is that they've tried to put some more pressure on online marketplaces by saying that if, for instance, an average consumer can't tell the difference between Amazon selling a product and a third party trader on their platform selling the product, then Amazon could perhaps be liable. What we would want to see is that online marketplaces such as Amazon, such as Wish, such as eBay, they have such a, like a large control over their third party sellers that they should actually have joint liability when it comes to these products. That's, I think, the only way to, to make sure that they take some sort of product safety responsibility. If they don't have an economic incentive to keep their platforms free from, from dangerous products, they, they won't, uh, basically, they won't uh, put in the man hours to, to make that work. Uh, so we, we need joint liability, we need real liability. Thank you very much, Mr. Aktag and Mrs. Petra Wikström. You are the director of public policy at Shipstead. And uh, in what aspect or what part of Shipstead is interested in this legislation? We know it, for instance, as a publishing company. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, as you said, we are a publisher uh, in the Nordics, but we also have classified marketplaces uh, and we have price comparison sites uh, and we also invest in startups. So for us, of course, this uh, legislation, both when it comes to the DSA and the DMA, are really of utmost importance. And uh, we are looking at these both legislations from many different perspectives. Uh, as a publisher, it's very important that we really uh, ensure uh, freedom of expression and democracy and make sure that uh, the platforms are taking down illegal content, but that they are also making sure that editorial content is uh, available on the platforms, that we can spread editorial published content on these platforms, that, that they cannot take down that content that had already been decided by an editor and that has constitutional protection. So that is very important. It's also important to make sure that the platforms are safe. And we also think that there should be a stay down element uh, in order to really protect users uh, and make sure that we take down all illegal content. Content. And from classified marketplaces, um, we need to make sure that there are a different kind of rules here because uh, to sort of explain a little bit what the classified marketplace is, uh, if you compare it, for example, to Amazon, a classified marketplace is where consumers sell used goods to each other or where we have small, small companies, one person companies that reach their customers via our platforms. Some of these obligations in the digital services sector are a bit difficult for these kind of platforms because we don't have the full control over the ads that the users and the consumers put in, although we do a lot of work for security we work with local authorities, with the police and so on. Um, I'm happy to come back to that, but I think it's very important to understand that online marketplaces are not all the same and there are differences in how we can deal with the content on these online marketplaces. And Mrs. Wickstrom, from a Shipstead point of view, are you happy with this proposed legislation? Is it a welcome package or what is your main impression? We are very uh, happy and I would say, of course, as everybody else has said, that it's long due, uh, especially now what has happened in the US. It's important that we get rules in place for liability and really understand who should be uh, taking the responsibility for um, making sure that we have freedom of speech. 
on these platforms. In particular, we are very uh, supportive of the Digital Markets Act. Uh, this is really a legislation that is important for us as a company where we are very innovative. Uh, we use a lot of data in order to understand what our customers want and need. Uh, and we are facing a lot of challenges by a few large digital gatekeepers that actually come in between us and our consumers, where they dictate how we can uh, sort of talk to our consumers. We don't even always know if uh, a consumer is buying a digital subscription, for example, in the ad store. We don't know who that person is and we don't know what that person reads because we don't get that kind of access to the customer data. But we also don't have transparency, for example, in the online advertising network. So we don't always understand the prices that we need to pay or what the advertiser has put in, how much money actually comes to the publisher out of that. So there is a great need for this DMA legislation, but it's also very important that it really only tackles the problems we see on the market. And the scope is really about only those players that are sort of large gatekeepers and almost have a monopoly position on the market. Thank you very much, Mr. Wikström. And I turn then to Mr. Georgios Mavros. You are public policy and government relations manager at Google. And I think you are one of the bigger companies in, in the world, but everyone obviously knows Google. Um, but how would you describe Google to somebody? You do a lot of things perhaps that we are not aware of. Well, first of all, thanks for the invitation. Uh, I'm happy to you know take part of to this important event. And uh, I believe that we will have the opportunity to discuss extensively in the months to come some of the points that have been raised previously, but generally speaking about the, the DMA. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this question. I'll try to keep my time for the next questions that might come up because I do believe that most of us know what Google stands for. We offer a, a range of services such as, uh, you know, search engine, uh, Android, uh, YouTube, uh, mostly I would say ad funded uh, products and services to you know, globally. Um, and uh, by the way, we do have a strong presence in Sweden as well. We do have, uh, I think a, around 200 engineers who actually develop our uh, communication apps such as uh, Google Meet and, and Google Duo. Uh, so, you know, Sweden is close to, to, to our heart. Uh, but to answer briefly your question and keeping my time for the, for, for the rest of the questions, uh, I would say that in order to describe Google, we need to go back to the fundamentals. And the fundamental for us is our mission statement. And the mission statement of Google is that Google, whatever the various products that we might have, we organize the world's information and we make it universally accessible and useful. In other terms, people can find the information that they are looking for with Google, and they can also create content. I'm referring to you know, apps, uh, user-generated content on YouTube, and so on and so forth. So information and content that other users might uh, be looking for and they might find through uh, our various products. So I would say that this is where uh, the matching magic takes place. Thank you very much, Mr. Mavros. And to my second question, then you mentioned in your mission statement, the world and global, and you are presumably a company that would be considered a gatekeeper by this legislation. Do you consider that Google holds a lot of power and perhaps too much power? I think, I mean, again, this is a European legislation which I think targets a very limited number of tech companies. Uh, yes, and we believe that Google will be uh, among them. Um, we do have many successful products. Uh, I think with the hindsight, we might probably underestimate the challenges that we had to make these products as successful as, as they are today. If we look back in 2006 and 2007, for instance, when we have started this Android experience, uh, there was you know, Apple with the iPhone and uh, uh, basically creating the app, the app economy, by the way. So the endeavor was, I mean, the, it, it was quite a bet at the time. If we look back at another of our very popular products, Chrome, for instance, and we needed to go back 
when we were developing Chrome, we had to compete with you know, Explorer or Chrome, but indeed we do have many uh, successful products. Now, I mean, markets, uh, do, do we have power? H how do you quantify power? There are different ways of doing that, right? First of all, I would argue that if a company or a handful of companies have a lot of power, it means usually less choice uh, for the end users, for the consumers. We believe, I believe that we have never had that kind of extensive choice uh, when it comes, I mean, as, as users and as consumers, to find information using apps online. The choice that we have is unprecedented, uh, unprecedented and I'm happy to uh, explain a bit more because we have carried out uh, probably the largest consumer survey in Europe with 20,000 people that were uh, polled in, uh, around these issues. So another way to assess whether or not a company has a power is contestability, something that we have heard earlier, right? So the idea is that markets, the argument goes that markets become more and more concentrated. You have fewer companies, fewer companies leads to less, to less diversity and less innovation. I mean, it's, it's an argument. It's an argument that we need to seriously take into account. But if we look at the data, we do see, for instance, that in 2019, uh, venture capital investment in, in Europe was around, I think, 34 billion, uh, which was actually an increase of 40% year over year. And this begs the question on why would, you know, financial markets, markets invest in European startups and scale-ups if there was a big issue around the contestability of the European digital markets. And if I may, and this is where I wanted to use my time, uh, if I may use another example, artificial intelligence, right? And we all know that when it comes to artificial intelligence, Google, Facebook, Amazon, probably Apple, the, they have invested massively in this space. Does it mean that we don't see smaller companies or we don't see newcomers there? This is not the case. According to an OECD report, dates back to 2018, but it's still relevant for, for the purposes of our discussion, uh, around 12% of the funding uh, in 2018 went to startups and scale-ups, up to 3% in 2011. So I would argue, as Marisa Jimenez said in the previous panel, yes, there are some companies that are more successful than others. And when it comes to Google, yes, we do have a lot of services and products which are extremely popular, but things move very fast. And we are talking about markets that can shift very quickly. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mavros. And I turn then to uh, Facebook again and Jakob Kuchacic, you are the colleague of uh, Mrs. Marisa Jimenez Martin and uh, she left the Digital Market uh, Act comments to you. So please, what is Facebook's view on the DMA legislation? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And, and again, also from my side, thank you for this opportunity to present our position. Um, yes, yeah, so on the DMA, I think the, the, the first point I really want to start out with is to say that we as a company recognize that there is a need for an evolution of the rule book. Um, and we certainly look very much forward to, contribu to contributing to that, um, to that discussion. And we certainly believe that the DMA um, is an opportunity um, um, to build a fit for purpose regulatory environment and there are positives. So, and, and I think um, Gerard has mentioned that in, in, in his intervention, the, the one positive that clearly stands out for us is the internal market perspective. We certainly, every company that it will be covered by the DMA benefits from one common rule book across the European Union rather than dispersed rule books uh, across, across our block. So if the DMA can be a, 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 a building block, so to speak, to make the, you know, the, the promise of, the, of a digital single market a reality, then that is obviously a, a, a good thing. Not least because the companies that are covered all operate cross-border and any future companies that will be successful and fall under the regulatory framework would benefit from that as well. So this is a positive. I think a second point on the positive side is also there are some interesting ideas, we believe, around 
how the benefits of technology could be more broadly distributed through, for example, data portability mechanisms. I think this is an area, this kind of wider distribution of the benefits of technology that is worthwhile exploring. But of course, I think um, there's also, we think there's also room for improvement. Um, I can maybe give you two very obvious examples on that side of things as well. Um, and I guess the most obvious, obvious one is that we are dealing with a um, regulation that covers a, a whole range, a big variety of companies with different business models and running very different core platform services. So of course, um, you know, there, I, I would say that there, there are legitimate questions around does a regulatory one size fits all approach really make sense? Um, in, you know, in such a dynamic area in which we, in which we operate and whether this kind of rather rigid application of the regulation is really, is really the right approach. It's certainly something that we would be very keen to, to explore as well. Um, and I think related to the point is also, and this is my second point that we believe there is a, there will be a greater need for companies to engage with the regulator. Um, you know, obviously the objective will be to make sure that we are um, fully compliant with the requirements, but at the same time that we avoid unintended consequences. And we believe that that will require a more participatory approach, greater dialogue with the regulator. And I think this is also an area where we can, we can improve on by reducing the rather mechanical application of this, um, of this regulation. So look, I think I just close, you know, by saying that at the end of the day, I think, you know, in our discussions, we really want to explore, you know, how to strike the right balance between meeting the objectives, legitimate objectives um, that the DMA tries to, tries to achieve, while obviously making sure that the incentives for, for companies to innovate, innovate remain, and while also making sure that the the benefits, uh, the consumer benefits that platforms have have um, have created, have brought, um, um, obviously remain remain uh, remain on the market. And and I stop here. Thank you very much, Mr. Kucharczyk. And I turn back to you, Mr. Rego Saliba. You hear the uh, comments from the industry and the stakeholders. Uh, some are positive. There are some suggestions. Uh, the European Union and you decided to go for a legislation that treats as gatekeepers very large companies, slightly independent of their business models and their ideas. Was that a, a very easy choice to go for this and thus applying different legislation to different size companies? Please. So again, this is a very important and, and relevant, relevant question. First of all, the point of departure, what, what has the European Parliament um, um, basically suggested in, in, our, in our proposal. Uh, so we moved forward this proposal, first of all, to define upon a number of uh, indicators um, who uh, basically will fall under the definition of a uh, gatekeeper, having a gatekeeper role. Um, first of all, we don't think that uh, the DMA should be applicable across the board and it should be applicable only to those companies which only to those platforms and players who uh, are defined as very large tech companies which basically are sitting between business uh, consumers and also are controlling core services such as search engines, um, social and video sharing platforms, online marketplaces messaging messaging services and also advertising um, uh, products and although the commission has not named particular players even as has been also stated by representatives of um, facebook and google who are two of the um, largest and biggest uh, players um, i think that um, the rules moved forward by the commission the First of all, 6.5 billion um, turnover and also the 45 million threshold is, first of all, a, a, a good measure to at least restrict these measures to uh, a particular sector of players because um, with bigger, 
bigger number of users with, 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 with bigger size comes also um, bigger responsibilities. So I think that we should be, and I agree totally with the commission that um, we should define who these big players are and we should not apply um, these uh, do's and don'ts list and these requirements to all players. Um, I think, I think uh, the commission has taken up also the approach being undertaken by us, uh, although, although we didn't restrict ourselves to only these two indicators, but we moved forward when it comes to defining who these players are, a number of, of, of uh, other indicators. But I believe that this should be um, the, the way forward when it comes to identifying who these players are who these players are. Uh, and I think that also an important point in this discussion is the issue with um, enforcement and also the issue with fines. And uh, having uh, a proposal which is saying that uh, the, these companies could end up facing 10% fine of a company's global uh, turnover uh, with um, also issues of breaking up when it comes to repeated uh, offenders. I think it, 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 it's also showing the commitment on behalf of the Commission to have the system which will ultimately not remain a system on paper principles, which would be difficult to enforce, but ultimately uh, it is also showing the willingness of the Commission to basically move forward these do's and don'ts list and ultimately have a system an ecosystem which is more contestable, more fair, to give a fair chance for European innovators, European SMEs, to ultimately be able to compete fairly in this, in this uh, ecosystem, which unfortunately has become congested by a few players which are basically playing by their, by their, own, by their own rules. Thank you very much, Mr. Saliba and Mr. Mavros on the uh, question of fines. I don't know the turnover of Google, but I'm guessing 100 billion euros or somewhere around there. And five to 10% of that would give us 10 billion euros in a potential fine. Do you find this a, a reasonable amount of fine for a company for these kinds of breaches? Or how do you see this particular point on the fines, please? Yeah, I mean, I, I would love to talk a bit more about the substantive parts of the DMA, but I, I, I understand that we need to be mindful of, of, um, of the time. Um, I, I would argue that fines are part of any sort of regulation. I, I, I wouldn't necessarily need to focus on that. It's not up to a company to decide what is the amount of a fine which actually is laid down or set out by a specific legislation. I think what we need though is to have some sort of, you know, due process. Uh, we need also to have some sort of clarity around the obligations which are imposed by the Digital Markets Act. We do have the Article 5 obligations which are supposed to be kind of self-executing and blacklisted. And we do have the Article 6 obligations which may be subject to specification. I think we probably need to, to make uh, a more straightforward distinction between uh, these two sets of obligations, right? Because, I mean, particularly because of the fact that uh, they are followed by that kind of extremely important fines and other sort of uh, sanctions uh, in case of non-compliance or systemic non-compliance. I think as Jacob mentioned earlier, I think particularly for those obligations which are not straightforward or self-explanatory, those that are part of Article 6, we need uh, to provide for the obligation of the European Commission to come up with some sort of guidelines or specifications on what it means, what it means interoperability, right? I mean, how are we going to put this in place? What kind of services, I mean, what are kind of services are affected? Uh, we do have some notions or practices which do not have uh, the same actually meaning in online marketplaces or some other sectors that are covered by the DMA, right? So we would need that kind of guidance for the European Commission. We would need that kind of regulatory dialogue with the enforcer, the regulator, which at this stage at least is the European Commission. We would need some sort of due process. Uh, our, you know, ability to basically justify uh, the specific behavior, uh, explain why we're doing 
something which might be, by the way, pro-competitive. It might be useful for the retailers of a specific sector. It might be useful uh, for the end user. So we would argue that these are the kind of arguments that need to be taken into account when we consider and assess the obligations which are laid down, particularly uh, right now under Article uh, 6. And actually, all this should inform at the end what happens with the fines and the other sanctions that are laid down in the DMA. Thank you very much. Mr. Mavros and Mr. Kuchacic, do you see things the same way from Facebook as Google does, or do you have a different take on this? Well, let me start with, or just kind of um, continue where, where, where Georges has left off that, that need for, for guidance and clarification and in a way more flexibility in the system. I think that it is certainly an area where um, the regulation could benefit from greater inspiration from competition or enforcement, actually. Um, and what I mean specifically is that, yes, under competition law, what the regulator or the enforcer does, it obviously enforces the rules against the company over a given practice. But that practice is always seen in its proper economic context to determine whether or not it really has an anti-competitive or potentially pro-competitive impact on the market. And there is flexibility in that companies are able, as George has said, to provide Let's See, we lost your sound, I think. And picture it froze. Let's see, we will come back to you. In the meantime, if I ask Mrs. Wikström, you are obviously in Sweden considered a large company, but on a global scale, I would say considered a, s a small company. Uh, how do you see this legislation going forward? Will this be helpful to a company like Shipstead? And if you were to wish for one thing, what would that be, please? Yeah, well, uh, absolutely. I think that the reason why we have been really calling for this kind of legislation is that we see that even if we are a sort of a large company in our own region, there is no possibility for us to negotiate with certain gatekeepers on the market. Uh, we are in a situation where we are dictated the rules on how we can uh, talk to our customers, the information we get about our customers, the way that we use the data that we get from the customers. All these things are dictated to us and we don't have the possibility to negotiate. And if we don't get access to data about how our customers, our own readers, our users are using our services. It's very difficult to develop those products. So this uh, legislation is really key in order for us to continue to be innovative, to continue to grow and to continue to uh, offer better services for our users. And I think this is really key to remember that it's only about gatekeepers, it's only about the possibility for business users to really know better what their own users are doing. And that's why I think this is so important for us uh, as a company, but also for the startups that we also invest in, that they can grow. Uh, and I hope that uh, many countries uh, will understand this need so that their own digital sector really can continue to grow and innovate. Thank you. And Mr. Aktag, we hear the comments from the business side. Uh, as a consumer, how interested are we in having our personal data out in this way? And do you think that will change with the new legislation? I think there are some, uh, some notable positive sides in, in the DMA and the DSA regarding uh, transparency, for instance, about what data is collected and how it's spread to third parties. I do, however, believe that just as Saliba mentioned in the, in the INCO report, that they had some more far-reaching uh, um, transparency uh, obligations that they wanted to, to, to interject. And I think that would be very positive. Uh, when when Georgios from Google here talks about, you know, what is power, I think that Google is a powerful company because Google and Facebook together basically have a monopoly in the ad tech sector. Meanwhile, smaller companies don't even know uh, the amount of money they pay uh, in, in fees in order to, to gain access to this this very lucrative sector. So, so I think that more transparency in the ad tech sector would be great because that would, in the long run, also, I think, benefit consumers' uh, privacy. So more, more transparency would be, would be really effective, I think. 
Thank you very much. And Mr. Ego Saliba, I will give the last uh, words to you to uh, wrap up the debate and perhaps with a question also that the President of the European Parliament, Mr. Uh, David Sassoli, has invited the chief executives of these giant tech companies, Google, Apple, Facebook and Amazon, to Brussels to a hearing. What will be the expected outcome of such a hearing and what do you see as the expected outcome of this legislative procedure? When can we see something in place, please? So hopefully our ambition is as soon as possible. We see something as soon as possible materializing ideally. Um, and, and I think that is uh, what we as European Parliament are, are looking up to, to see something concrete uh, which happens in this legislature uh, in the next um, two to three years maximum. I think that the hearing will be an interesting one. I don't see any reason why these big tech companies which were invited by the president of the European Parliament should not um, accept, accept this, this, this invite because they play a very important role in European uh, citizens' lives when it comes to economy, when it comes to their fundamental freedoms and rights. So it's really important for us and, 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 and the European Parliament is uh, the only democratically elected institution within uh, within Europe, so it's really important for us to um, hear what they they have to say. Our expectations are there will be definitely this is a natural thing, and we have seen a lot of lobbying happening since before we started uh, our drafting. This is something natural that happens, lobbying both from um, players, main players in the in the ecosystem, but also lobbying from civil society and, and NGOs. It's always healthy to hear different opinions, but ultimately, as I said in my first remarks, we have a very important responsibility resting on our shoulders to basically set higher standards, set higher standards when it comes to a high level of consumer protection, set higher standards to protect uh, fundamental rights and freedoms, set higher standards also, especially when it comes to the DMA to have more a more contestable market. So I believe that the ambition is high. Uh, the Parliament's position is very clear and all the reports have been approved by big majorities. So the position is clear. Gathering cross-party support. Now we want that the Commission and also Council will, will be as ambitious as the Parliament has been during the past months to have a solid proposal so that we can not only um, set the standard for Europe, but also set the standard, an ambitious standard, uh, also for, for other continents. Thank you very much, Mr. Saliba. And as a viewer, if you are interested in continuing following this file, we will be able to organize more discussions like this. You just need to fill out the uh, evaluation that's available in the comments windows on, on YouTube and Facebook. And I say also very much thank you to Mr. Sina Laktag from Sveriges Konsumenter, Peter Wikström from Shipstedt, Georgios Mavros from Google, and Jakob Kucharczyk from Facebook. And thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you.